Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, so just so you know, this meeting is being recorded so that we can share later on our uh, YouTube channel for all the folks that didn't get to attend today. Uh, so welcome to uh, Marsh Billings Rockefeller's Artist Talk with Heather Heckel. Heather was our artist in residence this summer um, and she's coming in. This was her 17th residency with National Parks and Bureau of Land Management. Uh, and so today she's going to share a little bit about those experiences, a little bit more about um, her work at Marsh Billings. Um, we're, really, we're really excited to have her. And then um, I'm just going to go ahead and mute and uh, put the video off for everyone that is um, is uh, not not chatting with us right now. And Heather, you can take it away. Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Heather Heckel and I um, had the pleasure of being an artist uh, in residence at Marsh Billings Rockefeller this summer. Um, this artist talk was slightly delayed because of all of the uh, rains and flooding that happened. So that was quite an experience, but I'm glad that it was able to be uh, rescheduled. Um, and hopefully this venue will help uh, help this talk reach more people. So I think it kind of worked out in the end. Um, so a little bit more about me. Uh, I'm an artist and I'm also an art teacher. So uh, this past school year was, uh, I finished my 10th year of teaching public school art. And the first couple of years that I was teaching, um, I was also working at a summer camp um, during the summer. So teaching over the summer as well. And realizing that that was a lot of teaching and I needed to take um, the summers and do something for myself. So I did a search, uh, something like uh, nature, summer, outdoors, art, something like that, and uh, found the National Park um, Artists in Residence website. So I was able to see that this program was available um, and it kind of combined a lot of things I was interested in, travel and art and um, lifelong learning, just all of the history and culture that comes along with the national parks. So I started investigating that and then that was in 2016 and I've been doing it ever since. Um, so I got totally hooked. I hope to keep doing this forever. Um, and like I said, this just this summer, I was able to do a residency at Marsh Billings Rockefeller that I'm still working on, um, but I was there for about three weeks, um, a couple of weeks ago. So I'm gonna take you through basically like a brief history of the other parks that I've been to. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see how uh, my art has changed over time. So just looking back and seeing how the process has changed. And also when you make site specific work, how the place and the time can really influence the art itself. So share my screen. So this is um, basically the website that I found where uh, you can see that the, there are a lot of national parks that offer artists uh, residencies and they each have um, their own links. So it's kind of cool to see like what they're interested in when you're applying, but there are plenty and plenty of sites, which is very exciting, I think, for anyone that's interested in this opportunity. And so this is a map, let me present this real quick. This is a map of um, the parks that I've been to so far, if it loads. Uh, so all over the place, um, it has definitely taken me in many different locations, which is pretty exciting because I might not have necessarily traveled to these places before. So it really allowed me to see some places that I might not have come across on my own. And the first park that I was a uh, artist in residence at was Hot Springs National Park. Uh, and the springs themselves are over 4,000 years old. And the um, temperature in the springs is 147 degrees, so pretty hot. Um, the park still has like a spigot that um, anyone from the public can come and fill up like gallon jugs of this um, hot spring water. So it's supposed to be have healing properties. And um, this park was interesting because there were basically two mountains on either side. 
And then there was a row of bathhouses down the center. So like Victorian style bathhouses, when bathhouses were really popular, they were constructed in the 1800s. Uh, and it was neat to see that there was this sort of little strip of land down the center of the park. One side was federal because it is part of the National Park Service. And the other side was just uh, civilian land. So it was kind of interesting to see the, the difference between the two. And um, Hot Springs, they do say that it was the first national park uh, designated site, not officially. It was called a reservation back then, not as in the Native American uh, reservation, but like reserved land. Um, so it actually predates Yellowstone by 40 years. So that's an interesting conversation to have about which one is officially the first uh, national park. But for this site, for my artwork, um, I definitely wanted to capture the intense uh, July heat in Arkansas. So um, I wanted to reduce um, things to just black and white to kind of show that intense contrast. So I was doing uh, black and white oil paintings. And then I was also really interested in the surrounding um, signage in hot springs because there were a lot of like retro restaurants and hotels and it was kind of you know like a 1950s time capsule in that way so I really wanted to show um a lot of those signs and I can show you so these were the paintings that I did and then I also did a lot of um colored pencil drawings for the signs that were surrounding the park so it was really kind of a fun uh exercise in typography and um, you did have this feeling we're kind of going back in time. So that was pretty neat. And then the next park that I visited uh, was Weir Farm National Historical Park in Connecticut. So that's uh, the home and studio of American Impressionist J. Alden Weir. So he was buddies with all of the, the Hudson River School painters. Um, he was friends with John Singer Sargent, if you're familiar with that artist. So he would invite his artist friends to come to his land in Connecticut. Um, I believe he bought all of his land, many, many acres, I think over 100 acres, for something like a $500 still life painting. It was an interesting story about how he got the land uh, very affordably back then. And another neat part about artist residencies is getting to stay in really interesting park housing. So for this park, I was able to stay in uh, the caretaker's house, which was built in the 1800s. So it was definitely neat to kind of live in that history. Um, that's definitely one of my favorite parts about it is how there are, um, you're totally immersed in the experience. So a really neat uh, place to stay while I was there. And for this um, artwork, I definitely did like traditional landscape paintings. Um, and then I also was very interested in the interior of that caretaker's house. So I did um, colored pencil drawings of kind of everyday objects like these copper pipes. Um, and I can show you a few more for that. Um, so these are some of the interior scenes. So hangers, you know, bathtub, uh, doorknobs, carpet, um, old mailbox. So like everyday objects, um, this particular mounted buck was in uh, J. Alden Weir's main house, but the rest was in the caretaker's house, an old TV. Um, and then these kind of more traditional landscape paintings. So I would say for these first two residencies, I was definitely interested in um, kind of capturing what was in front of me. It was very uh, kind of an academic exercise in that way. Uh, not very conceptual yet. Um, the next park I was a resident, an artist at was uh, Lake Roosevelt National Recreation Area in Washington State. And that land was really interesting because um, I did not know before I went that Washington State has uh, many different ecosystems, including rainforest and desert. And so this was a really interesting way to see all of the different ecosystems in Washington state uh, around this lake because the lake is so long. So it's over 150 miles long, um, providing over 600 miles of shoreline. And this lake was created 
um, because of the Grand Coulee Dam. So the dam created the lake. Unfortunately, uh, Native Americans had been there for 9,000 years previously. Um, so their entire way of life was completely destroyed when the lake was created. So definitely a controversial past there. Um, and the lake is also governed by five different governing bodies. So we have the National Park Service, the Bureau of Reclamation, Bureau of Indian Affairs that were made up of the um, Colville and Spokane uh, reservations. Also the Washington Department of National Resources, Natural Resources and the United States Coast Guard. So there were five uh, entities that all um, kind of came together to try and manage the lake and at the visitor's center at the Grand Coulee Dam, um, there was a game, an interactive game you could play where you had to make decisions and every decision that you made uh, made someone angry. So it was really interesting to see how um, everyone had differing opinions and then to be able to work together to try and manage this uh, very large amount of land and water was certainly a lesson in uh, management and bureaucracy. So that was um, something that I found to be an interesting um, interactive game to play. And um, just a little bit more about the dam. Uh, it would take, according to them, uh, two direct hits from an atomic bomb to dissemble it because of the incredible amount of concrete and you know whatever else goes into making the dam. And also the amount of concrete you could build a four lane highway from Washington state to Maine and back again with all the concrete they used to make the dam. So pretty impressive um, engineering feat. Uh, and for this piece, I started to get a little more conceptual. So not just looking at what was in front of me, but kind of trying to make a statement about it at the same time. So I was really interested in the textures that I saw um, and kind of how the lake was visible sort of no matter where you were in the park officially. Um, and I wanted to keep the water in the lake, the white of the paper to kind of show that the absence, you know, the water wasn't always there. And also sort of the whitewashing of the concept of, you know, a dam being built that's this modern thing, but also is destroying all this history and culture of previous people. And just kind of in the name of progress, but then, you know, kind of what's underneath that and how it's a much more complicated situation. Um, and I think there is a movement today to sort of um, move beyond dams. I think sometimes they're getting rid of some of them or there's not as much energy being generated from them. So I think there's a lot of discussions about that too. So it's an interesting topic and I'll show you. So, uh, I did some drawings in the surrounding area as well while I was there. Um, this bottle here, the water from Washington, when they first opened the dam, they had every state beauty queen <laughs> come to the dam. So however many states there, were, I think 48 in 1941, um, and they all had water from their home state. Uh, and so when the dam was finished, they all poured um, a gallon of water from their home state over the dam to kind of show the United States, you know, progress of this um, incredible engineering feat being built. Um, so that was interesting. So all the bottles were there and I chose to draw the one for Washington since that was the state. Um, lots of interesting, you know, signs. Um, there was a mission house, that's the structure in the center there, near the train, um, totem pole on the left. And then a uh, couple more drawings and then the two oil paintings as well. And then the next park uh, was the Wash uh, Whiskey Town National Recreation Area. Um, so this was once again, a place where, and all these parks in America anyway, um, you know, all had native people that used to live there. And I wanna be mindful of that. Um, so for Whiskey Town, it was the Wintu people lived there for thousands of years. And then the California Gold Rush happened. Um, the name Whiskey Town, apparently a man was, um, his mule, the pack on his mule broke and it had a barrel of whiskey and it rolled down the hill and broke open into the creek. So it became Whiskey Creek. And then the adjacent town became uh, Whiskey Town. 
Um, and President Kennedy dedicated uh, Whiskey Town Dam in 1963, uh, two months before he was assassinated. So um, there's a lot of documentation of, you know, he's a speech he gave there and um, kind of some significance in that it was later in his presidential career. And the lake, I believe, is, I think, 10 miles wide or so. And there's a lot of beautiful waterfalls, um, a lot of interesting land around it, and a lot of wildlife. Saw a bobcat while I was there. That was neat. Um, so for this one, uh, the park did ask me to show um, uh, employees and visitors enjoying the park. So um, I showed a woman sitting on a bench there looking at the lake and then uh, a National Park employee working on a building. Um, there was a, I think a boys camp in 1950, like um, juvenile delinquents that used to be there. So there was these uh, buildings in part of the park that were kind of frozen in time as well. Um, so that's one of those buildings. I think they since um, took those away, but they were there while I was there. So it was neat to be able to see that. And then also just a lot of Americana, you know, motel signs, um, very retro. So that was fun to see. And so I tried to capture some of the local buildings and signage in my sketchbook. And then also the finished pieces from the park. And then next was uh, Herbert Hoover National Historic Site. So um, on the right there is the tiny cabin that Herbert Hoover was born in. Um, he was orphaned at age nine, so he didn't live in West Branch, Iowa for too long, but um, he did spend his early life there. And uh, he was a uh, raised a Quaker, so um, one of two uh, presidents. The other one was Nixon, which is interesting to me. I would not have guessed that. Um, and the other neat thing about this place is uh, there was a uh, quite a large prairie. So they um, were, I think part of it had existed all along, but they were definitely letting it go back to prairie. So really beautiful trail that you could walk through and um, just experience the prairie. Uh, and so at the time I learned a lot of the names of the flowers. I can't remember too many of them now, but um, I was recently reminded that the prairie uh, plant roots can go um, as deep as 15 feet. So they're quite uh, anchored there and I think really good for um, preventing erosion and all kinds of stuff. So it was neat to have that on the land. Um, and then Hoover and his wife are both buried on the land. And then there's also the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, not part of the National Park Service, but also on the land. So you can see where he was born. You can visit his grave. You can visit his uh, presidential library all in this very small amount of land um, that is that park site. So for this uh, park, I wanted to capture um, everything I could about the space while I was there. This one was unusual in that it was uh, a month long. So residencies can traditionally be like two weeks. So this one was quite long and I really appreciated the amount of time that I got to spend there. Um, so on the left here, we have um, the schoolhouse where uh, Herbert Hoover attended. And then on the right, we have his boyhood train. Uh, so he actually played with that. Um, that one was on display in the presidential library, but I really enjoyed being able, being able to see you know, something that he actually uh, played with when he was growing up. And um, this uh, painting in the lower left corner um, is a slot where uh, in the meeting house where the um, Quakers met on Sundays, they were very diplomatic. And um, I think men and women sat on opposite sides of the space, but they all got to vote. Um, it's very democratic. And so this was the voting slot where they got to pass their ballots through so that, you know, everyone's opinion could be counted. Um, and so the park chose that one uh, to be donated to them. So traditionally parks will pick a piece of artwork um, if they have space in their collections. So that is part of their permanent collection. Um, but otherwise, they asked that I focus on uh, the architecture in the park. So that's something that I hadn't um, really spent any time drawing before. So on the left here, we have the meeting house. 
Um, on the right, this was the mayor's house, and that was the house that I got to stay in while I was at the park. So I think that was built in the 1850s. It definitely creaked a lot at night. <laughs> and then um, all the other houses that are on the grounds, including the outhouse in the middle there, um, but a lot of history. And there's the um, cabin that he was born in. And then this is the stove in the meeting house, which I thought was neat. It was fun to do a really long drawing uh, for that as well. And then you can see a bit of the prairie land there with a farm on the grounds, a uh, barn on the grounds as well. And then up next, uh, Indiana Dunes National Park. Um, so this park was interesting because it was so fragmented um, that when, if you look at a map of the park, there's like little blobs of land here and there um, all over the place. It's not just one giant piece of land. And there are steel mills um, sprinkled between all of the like national park land as well. So you have, it's an interesting juxtaposition for, you know, preserving and conserving natural land and then having um, these, mil these mills that do, you know, create a bit of pollution. So it was, and, you know, differing interests and all kinds of stuff. So it was a, a very unusual park in that way. Um, and it also is home to a black oak savanna, which is rare. Um, we got to visit a bog, which I had not been to previously. So um, some a lot of uh, variation in the environment. There was also a working farm um, and Houses of Tomorrow, which uh, were part of the 1933 World's Fair. And if you look at the left here, I did a drawing of one of them that was inspired by a Floridian cruise ship, I think. Um, so in the 1933 World's Fair, they had these um, Houses of Tomorrow, which were supposed to be like the future of housing where people could essentially like build their own or pick one out. They were kind of um, the beginning of like mass produced housing or the concept of it. One of them was like completely made out of steel. Um, another one was made out of like a rare type of sandstone, I think. So this one I thought was the most attractive just because, um, you know, it has railings on the outside that do look like you're on a cruise ship. Um, if anyone has seen the Barbie movie recently. It's like very Barbie dream house. Um, and then on the, on the right is a cow from the uh, farm that's on the grounds. Um, but the Houses of Tomorrow was interesting because after the World's Fair was over in Chicago, they floated these houses down to the lakeshore where the park is now. And the park also um, did a program where they leased them to private families for something like 70 years. So the families can enjoy these really amazing houses. Um, they have to put their own money into repairs and you know preserving them and everything, which costs millions of dollars, but they get to use them with their families. And then they um, get to return them to the park at, at the end of their, you know, their 70 year lease. So very unusual program, but a really nice way for, I think people to enjoy them and also for the park to get funding for them, I think. And, so on the lower right there, it was made out of kind of an unusual sandstone of some kind, and it wasn't very durable. So I think a lot of work had to go into that one. Um, this was a family that kind of kept building onto this house. This was the piece in the middle there that the park ended up taking. It wasn't a house of tomorrow. It was just like a, I think started as a farmhouse and then kind of expanded. We have the Black Oak Savannah here on the right. Um, more houses of tomorrow and then just the lake i wanted to capture a lot of the the lakefront there and then on the the house on the upper right here is the one that was made out of um steel including like all of the you know screws and like everything was it was a steel house it was very interesting um up next was the hubble trading post uh, National Historic Site. And this one was in Arizona. Uh, and it was bought, the land was bought in 1878. And this was 10 years after Navajos uh, could return to their uh, native lands. So, and that was after quite a terrible situation there, but they were allowed to return um, back to their native lands. So this kind of, this trading post was erected near the same time as that. So this park is unusual in that it is in the middle of Navajo Nation, so uh, quite a large reservation. And this is a, 
right in the middle of it. So if you drive through that area, um, you may come upon the Hubble Trading Post, which is the oldest uh, trading post that it's still still um, in use. So you can stop and get, you know, snacks or um, they sell a lot of uh, Native American weavings and jewelry and all kinds of stuff. So it's been continuously operating for all that time. There's also a working farm um, on this site. And this park was interesting in particular because I got to stay in a traditional guest hogan, so like a circular um, dwelling there. So, and it was neat because at night you could see the entire Milky Way, um, very, very beautiful land. And it was fun to visit the animals there too. They had a horse and turkey and sheep and uh, very kind park rangers um, gave me many tours of the space. Um, so very generous with their time. And so for this one, I wanted to do oil paintings of just what I was seeing um, and also colored pencil drawings. Uh, so there's the horse that uh, lives in the park. His name is Rambo. And then on the right is a basket weaving. Um, that's a colored pencil drawing of one of the nearby tribes. And show you the rest. Uh, and the park ranger, uh, Ranger Alvis here on the upper left um, was the one who uh, took me around and told me all about the park. And his daughter here is, um, that's a drawing of her done in a uh, red Conte crayon. So um, one of the artists that did a lot of Native American portraits at the time, um, Burbank was his last name. Uh, I wanted to do a portrait of his daughter in that style. So um, that was neat. And the painting on the upper right here uh, was the painting that the park decided to take. So of a weaving. And my next stop was Homestead National Historical Park uh, in Nebraska. And this was established for the Homestead Act of 1862, which went into effect in 1863. Um, and at the time it was to promote Western expansion. So uh, if you qualified and I think paid a small fee, you were given 160 acres to then work the land, build a dwelling. Um, and after five years, you could uh, keep that land. So this site in uh, Beatrice, Nebraska was the first um, homestead uh, those 160 acres um, that was given out under that act. And kind of unusual, very unusual for the time. Um, this land was also granted to uh, freed slaves, people of color, um, women, if they were heads of the household. So uh, very unusual for the time that they were able to um, get land as well. Uh, and for this one, I was just very interested in uh, they had a lot of um, antique farm implements. So I was just totally interested in the shapes and the overlapping shapes. And a lot of these farm tools were very, uh, you know, lots of scary looking shapes, you know, like they would, um, they definitely looked like they could, uh, they were very sharp and pokey and all that stuff. So I thought, well, let me try and overlap some of those shapes. Um, so getting a little more conceptual with this particular uh, series. And also um, there was a schoolhouse here and I wanted to, I did a painting of that and then overlay some of those geometric shapes from the farm implement over top and playing around with moving the paint around a little bit as well. Um, so I'll show you here. So it was fun to blur the paint, um, you know, get a little messy because usually I was much more trying to be exact with it. So I tried to loosen up a little bit. And then all of these uh, really amazing shapes of all of these um, tools, saws and um, scythes and all kinds of stuff. And then there was a cabin on the land, uh, the one on the left here, that I believe housed a family of 14 at one point. And when you walk in there, you see how absolutely tiny it is. So pretty amazing back then that um, so many people were able to live in such a small place. Uh, oh, and also a way to tie that back, um, Hubble of Hubble Trading Post was also a homesteader. So that's um, 
think he got land related to that act as well. So it was kind of fun too, going between these different residencies and seeing how I could connect them. Uh, and my next stop was at uh, Sagamore Hill National Historic uh, Site where Teddy Roosevelt had his summer White House. So he would go to the White House during the year and then summers he would spend um, in this home uh, in Oyster Bay on Long Island. Um, so mostly it's just the house, the mansion. You can take tours of it and see all of his belongings and where he lived. And then also a bit of um, nature preserved in that uh, on those grounds as well. And for this one, um, I was so struck by Teddy Roosevelt's interest in both family and the outdoors that I wanted to put those two concepts together. So um, I did objects from inside the house and then paired with a natural item that I found on the grounds. So this green frog here was uh, owned by his sons, um, a little porcelain figurine. And then uh, I found those flowers with a bee on top um, in the garden. Uh, and I wanted to kind of put those two together. Same with the pine cone on the right there. These were two objects that were owned by his sons, uh, little toys they played with porcelain figurines. And then um, I wanted to put that outside element on there as well. And show you those. Um, this was the, on the outside of the front door, we have this eagle. Uh, paired with some, um, I think they were doing a meadow land as well. I don't think it was officially a prairie, but they were letting part of the land go back to meadow. So those were flowers um, in that meadow. Uh, vase. Um, his uh, wife, Edith Roosevelt, um, she, this is the house on top, but this is, she uh, embroidered Sagamore Hill onto all of their blankets and sheets and anything that was laundered because uh, back then, when they sent their laundry away, um, there were so many Roosevelt's on Long Island, they would get their cousins <laughs> sheets back and all kinds of stuff. So she embroidered the name of their estate on that so they knew where to return the laundry. So it's kind of neat to see that a first lady uh, embroidered that. Um, and there's her pin cushion. And then I wanted to put uh, milkweed coming out of it. Um, and then this vase and this uh, bust of Washington were both in her study as well. So it was neat to see that the objects that they had collected. And then uh, Big Cypress um, National Preserve. And this is about 40 minutes uh, where away from where I'm staying now. Uh, I'm in Naples, Florida currently. So um, Big Cypress, uh, is preserves the swamp, um, but a fun fact is nearby, not on national park land, but there is the country's smallest uh, post office located nearby. Um, so you can see it there on the right and it's 56 square feet. So very small. So I got to see the country's smallest uh, post office as well. Um, but Big Cypress was home um, to the Calusa uh, Native Americans, European expl explorers arrived in the 1500s, but also the uh, Mikasuki and Seminoles um, lived on this land um, and still live in the area. Um, and when the Tamiami Trail was completed, um, connecting Tampa and Miami, it allowed people to drive across the swamp if they wanted to, and that led to settlement in this area, um, Gulf Coast area. So you can definitely see the swamp when you're driving across the state because that road does connect the two coasts. And for this um, series, I wanted to uh, capture visitors at the park as well as the objects that they were looking at. Um, these, this man was not looking at this abandoned gas station, but uh, I just wanted to show a close up of two of the drawings. Um, so there were, uh, lots of visitors to see. And it was really fun to take kind of candid pictures of people and, and their interest in what they were looking at and then being able to illustrate those objects. I'll show you these. So visitors looking at all kinds of things um, in the park and there are wooden railings everywhere. So you can see those um, people leaning against those. And the piece that the park ultimately took was of this girl um, taking a picture with her phone. Uh, that's a young female panther taxidermied that was in the visitor center. 
Um, but it was really fun to do kind of Rockwell's uh, colored pencil drawings of people and kind of following their gaze. And I call him the leather man because he's leathery and he's wearing leather and he's looking at a leathery alligator. <laughs> um, this woman named Lisa, she was a uh, not officially in on Parkland, but she was a waitress at a nearby um, really good restaurant. So she was hilarious, and she let me take her picture. And then they also asked me to do some paintings of um, controlled burns. So uh they didn't have any paintings of that particular subject matter so in this case the park gave me um photo reference to look at and i was able to do those paintings and then uh great smoky mountains national park so this park um is certainly the largest national park uh, on the east coast and it is the most visited national park which i did not know until i was the artist there um, so definitely known for their diversity of plant and animal life, um, and the park does cover about 815 square miles, so an extremely large park, uh, and lots of really fun things to do, endless hikes, um, and, you know, biking, and you can float down the river, and um, just very, very beautiful diversity, and I think the most special memory from this park was uh, being able to see the synchronous fireflies. So uh, very rare, and they only um, come out at certain times of the year and in very particular places, this being one of them. So really an otherworldly experience um, walking through pitch black, uh, you know, night, and then seeing all of these um, synchronous fireflies around. It was very, very special memory. Um, and just a shout out too to all the, the park rangers that um, take me on private tours and, you know, get, allow me to see all these really special places, um, you know, things that they know about and share with me. And that was one that Ranger Sheridan at Great Smoky Mountains uh, allowed me to see. So that was really neat. Um, and so for this series, uh, I was interested in, on the right um, is an oil painting of a cabin. So they had a whole little collection of cabins um, or cottages rather that uh, the wealthy would like take the train down um, into Tennessee and and stay in these uh, cottages in the park um, back in like the 1930s. And these were all available. They kind of left the way they were. Um, I think they might have been recently renovated into the 1950s, but it was definitely like a time capsule and you could just wander around. And I was really struck with just the light and the shadow and um, really beautiful structures that were kind of, uh, you know, abandoned. And this was during the pandemic too. So it kind of tied into the, the way I, I was feeling and I think the country as a whole, that things were kind of standing still. And there was definitely this sort of isolated feeling, uh, but it was really neat to kind of see the embodiment of that um, during that time. So that was really fun to explore those. And on the left, I also did a series of uh, colored pencil drawings where I wanted to play around with kind of overlapping shapes again. So I chose uh, an animal, a plant, an insect, and a man-made structure from the park, um, and then sort of overlay them with different colors and shapes to kind of show the interconnectedness of everything that the park had to offer, and then add some um, white spots there for to represent the fireflies. That was special. And this one I worked on for quite a long time as well because it was during the pandemic. I was home, um, I had the time. So I did a whole series of these um, cottage paintings in oil paint. And just the way the light was bouncing around, I really, I really liked that. And then I ended up doing four of these colored pencil pieces. So this one is a snail. And this was um, an abandoned on the left here, an abandoned uh, part of a train that ended up in a creek. Not really sure how it got there because there were no train tracks nearby. So kind of a mysterious train engine. Um, but a very, very special place. And there were two, there were parts in North Carolina and Tennessee. So it was neat to see the 
the differences between both of those. And then Saguaro National Park in Arizona. Uh, and I have some fun cacti facts for you. Um, so the first eight to 10 years of a saguaro cactus's life, um, it is about one inch tall. So it takes all that time and then it obviously takes off. But imagine these really tall cacti just being an inch tall for basically a decade. Uh, and they're about 75 to 80 years old before they get their first arms. So there were a lot of old timers in the park. And every 10 years, the park does conduct a cacti census. So in 2020, uh, there were 1.9 million cacti in the park. And this park was interesting in that it was divided into a western and eastern side as well, basically with Tucson in the middle. Um, and basically, I just spent the entire time wandering around uh, cacti, and I was really struck by how um, they were like almost like people, you know, you're walking among friends or they, they were also individual, I guess, because their arms all looked different from each other. Um, and also when one is full of water, it can weigh over 2000 pounds. And the tallest one recorded was 78 feet tall. And then it blew over, I think in the wind in the eighties, but um, pretty amazing. So for this one, I wanted to, uh, I did kind of two different styles. On the left, I wanted to capture all of those um the texture of the the cacti kind of everywhere and if you walk through the desert you'll realize that like you know little things get stuck in your clothes and everything all the time because you know they're just it's everywhere so i wanted to really capture the um the cacti texture uh and then on the right i did a series of cacti portraits um to capture their kind of individual individualism and their personality so I also, uh, Tucson is full of neon signs, um, so I wanted to capture some of those as well. But it was really fun to uh, do cactus portraits. I had not done that before. And I did these in graphite, and then I did an acrylic wash over them, and then uh, solid colors for the background. And then these are the ones with all the texture. We also had a great uh, park ranger who showed us around. And then on to New Orleans, uh, to the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park. And this one was special because it was New Orleans. Um, it was right in the middle of the city. It was all about jazz. Um, and then the neat thing about New Orleans is you walk around and you just hear music absolutely everywhere. Um, birthplace of jazz and just, I really want to capture the city's rhythm and then, you know, the rhythm of jazz itself. So I did a series of drawings and um, the one on the right is oil pastel of just all the instruments. Um, there's a great museum there uh, that was just full of um, historical instruments. So I got to take a lot of photo reference there. And in the background, the paper I used, I wanted to do um, pattern paper just to capture that rhythm. So um, it's just full of music and I wanted to really capture kind of sound on paper. So um, I also got to do illustrations for the Junior Ranger booklet there. Um, so I got to do illustrations of musicians. Um, they're still working on getting me some female musicians as well, but these were the ones I did so far. Um, and street musicians, bucket drummers, and then a lot of uh, instruments. That cornet there with the lightning in the background was played by Louis Armstrong. A lot of drums, record, a mute, uh, and then the entrance to Armstrong Park there in New Orleans. Then Coltsville National Historical Park in Connecticut. So this, um, I had never done artwork about anything to do with weapons before, but this was the uh, former site of the Colt factory. And so Samuel Colt, 
was an interesting person. He, um, at age 14, his father sent him on a ship to learn about the world. I guess you did stuff like that back then, if you could, if you had the means. And so he sailed on a ship where he saw part of the ship, I think something used to raise and lower the sails, um, gave him the idea for the revolver. So like that same rotating piece um, on a on a Colt firearm came from his time at sea. And he was very much an entrepreneur. This is a picture of the factory. I think it's now turned into offices. Um, so those boards are no longer there on the bottom. And there's a forge and a foundry, those two structures in front of the dome that I think are going to be the future visitor center um, location when this park uh, kind of comes up to where it needs to be before it's really open to the public. Um, but yeah, he really liked the onion dome shape. So he decided to put one on top of his factory. And uh, I got to go tour the uh, dome. You get to go up and, you know, you could stand up in that space there. Um, and if you've ever driven up or down I-95, you may have passed uh, this structure. But he was just an entrepreneur. He got into like the wicker business, wicker furniture business. And because he had a lot of willow trees on his property, and he was kind of always thinking about ways to make business better. Uh, he also made the housing for his workers um, in the style of where they came from. So um, they look like little, you know, German or European houses because he wanted them to feel at home. Um, and then for this one, I got a little more conceptual. I wanted to put that onion dome in every single piece. Uh, so on the right there are two sides of the same structure. It was a carriage house or a stable, I guess. Um, so I want to kind of show like the east side and the south side at the same time, um, but with that uh, onion dome there. And also I wanted to do kind of doubles of everything because he was known for selling arms to both sides of conflicts, which I guess everyone did at the time, but he certainly did as well. And then just the duality around weapons. So life and death and winning and losing and kind of all of these two different sides of conflicts. So I kind of saw that concept everywhere when I was uh, researching the park. Whoops, I think I got out of order. Let me go up and then I'll come back. Um, so. On the lower left here is a young Samuel Colt. So that's him in his uh, sailor outfit there. Um, it's hard to see, but he's kind of studying that structure that then inspired him to make the revolver. And then there's his adult self. Um, we have management housing here. We have arm smear, which was the name of his estate. Um, and there were gold stars painted on the dome, like traditionally. But a gold star also represents like a fallen uh, military or a person in service if they die um, in service. You know, the gold star is, you know, representative of that as well. So I wanted to include that kind of everywhere just because it was about weapons. Um, here's some of the housing. So definitely looks like little gingerbread houses almost. But he wanted, once again, his workers to feel at home. So he constructed housing that um they would find familiar and then it's hard to see here but on the left there's a column and this was um the column uh on the church on the grounds he wanted his workers to attend church but he made these columns with uh pieces from the guns so like particular um screws or springs or if you look closely there's like parts of the gun in these columns so this is the only church on earth that uh, has parts of a weapon um, on the columns outside of it. But he wanted his workers to kind of identify with the space and uh, draw them in. So interesting story. Uh, next up is Klondike uh, Gold Rush National Historical Park in Seattle. So this, um, the Gold Rush really put Seattle on the map. Uh, Seattle is named for Chief Seattle. Um, who was Duwamish and Squamish, uh, so two different tribes. Um, and Seattle, the Coast Salish tribes lived there before um, everyone else arrived. Uh, but at the time, um, they were, everyone was very interested in embarking uh, to look for gold in the Yukon Territory because in 1897, 
about 68 prospectors arrived on a boat with about a ton of gold. So when that was heard around the world, everyone started to descend into the area. And Seattle was where they got uh, outfitted for their excursion. So Canada wouldn't let you cross the border until you had 2,000 pounds of provisions, so enough food for a year because they didn't want you to die uh, in Canada. So everyone came to Seattle to buy all that stuff. And a lot of businesses got their start there, like Nordstrom's um, sold shoes back then. You know, now we know them as a giant, you know, chain. But back then, they you would get your shoes at Nordstrom's. And um, so people had to get all of their provisions before they went to search for gold. And on the right, um, we see the Golden Staircase which was the Chilkoot Pass that uh, was 1,500 steps um, carved into the ice. So you can see these people climbing these stairs um, with their provisions on their back. They definitely had gold fever. And so I really wanted to show um, the provisions that they had on site in the visitor center were beautiful works of art. So I wanted to kind of show the artwork on these like cans of regular food, like this is canned salmon, for example. But I also wanted to break apart these um, objects with the shape of the gold bar because people were, it was very chaotic at the time. It really, everything was changing. It was um, a lot of upheaval. And so I really wanted to show all that energy by kind of breaking apart these shapes. And then any of the spaces that were, um, connected, I put some gold leaf kind of shining through. So to show that that was kind of underneath everything. And down here, um, the they said that every mile that was walked um, turned into 40 miles because people had to bring some of that 2000 pounds, set it down, go back and then pick up more. I mean, so it was really the amount of physical, you know, energy that was expended looking for gold was just very, very fascinating to me that um, people were very devoted. And it turns out, unfortunately, that those prospectors that returned on the ship had found most of the gold the first time around. So, um, but people still looked so, and they didn't know that at the time. Um, and then just a quick note about Alabama Hills. Uh, this is a national scenic area. This was a residency through the Bureau of Land Management, but very similar to other national park um, residencies. And this is in California, but it was named for a sunken Confederate ship. Um, so I guess when word traveled to Confederate sympathizers in California at the time, the miners, um, they decided to name it for that uh, sunken ship. Should probably be renamed in my opinion, but for now it's Alabama Hills um, in California. And Hollywood did a lot of filming here. I think over a hundred films were made, um, you know, have some shots seen shot in Alabama Hills because it was considered close to California, but could, you know, look like a lot of different terrain. Um, Iron Man was filmed here, uh, Django Unchained, um, a lot of like film noir just over, you know, basically the past 80 years, a lot of filming has been done here. And these um, formations are at the base of the Sierra Nevada. And it's the same age at like they're the same age as each other, but there's different erosion processes happening. So that kind of a you know um, explains the different colors and look. You know the Sierra Nevada is very pointy, and then this is all sort of smooth and rounded. Um, so very very different geological uh, phenomenon happening uh, close by. And so for this one, I tried something totally different. I wanted to do adhesive vinyl. Um, so that's the solid color you see. And then I used pattern paper with colored pencil um, to show the texture underneath. So that was fun to really just look at all the shapes of the rocks and create um, what I was seeing. And it was fun to experiment with different um, materials. and textures. And then last but not least, um, we arrive at Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historical Park. So uh, this was the studio that I got to work in. This residency was really special for many reasons, but uh, one being 
um, there were other artists around. So usually the artist residencies, um, I'm the only artist at the time. So it was really fun to have that community. Um, there were some days where uh, it was myself um, and two student artists, res artists in residence, and then also uh, Amy, the artist in residence from last year was there as well. So a lot of really uh, sense of community there and really nice to talk to other artists while I was working. Um, we also <laughs> got special access. So this was being supervised by a park ranger, um, but I did get to, you know, go into some areas where I got to take some pictures um, for reference. Uh, and rangers are very generous with their time taking me on private tours and um, really just giving me a lot of time and knowledge. So I appreciated that very much. Um, we also got to meet with, oops, we got to meet with um, someone in the archives. So we got to see uh, some historical photos. Um, that's me taking a picture of the blueprint of the gardens there on the left. And then we also got to see, there's an herbarium on site. So um, seeing uh, plants that were pressed, um, the one on the right there, I believe is 1920, but all the way back into the late 1800s of um, Elizabeth Billings did that, I believe. So really need to see, you know, history right in front of my eyes. And this place is also special because uh, it's all about, you know, um, conservation and there's an actively managed forest on site of about 550 acres. And then the historic mansion that was lived in by these uh, three families, the Marshes, the Billings and the Rockefellers, all with this similar uh, interest in conservation and um, preserving natural lands. And so I wanted to uh, really show that mansion because the mansion is quite amazing. It's very, very large. And I wanted to get really conceptual with this one and tie together the idea of like family trees with literal trees and showing how this particular space can be a foundation for um, ideas and how families kind of grow up and grow through the places, um, you know, where you're born and what you end up doing with your life. So I really wanted to conceptualize, capture that concept through everything um, that I was learning there in these pieces. So I would say that this uh, series is very unusual in that I've never gotten this conceptual with it. So it was really fun to um, try something totally new. And I work with materials I haven't previously worked with. Um, Yupo paper is uh, kind of a translucent paper. That's what I did the mansion in. And then collage and also um, Copic markers, which are like alcohol-based markers. So this one is one side of the mansion with the hermit thrush, which is Vermont's state bird. Here we have birches with some sulfur butterflies and day lilies. My aunt who lives in Vermont told me what flowers those were. So thank you Priscilla for that. Um, we have a downy woodpecker, uh, sink foils and pine trees in this one. And then this one I finished uh, this week while I've been in Florida. Um, there are ferns all over the grounds. Um, I believe one of the Rockefellers was interested in that, maybe another um, resident there. Someone will have to tell me, but there are ferns everywhere. Um, and these are maple trees and black capped chickadees. And then I just wanna show you a little bit of the process. I am working on um, the Belvedere next, uh, which is another structure on the um, grounds that has a pool. So this one is gonna deal with some reflections, but this is kind of what it looks like before I add um, the color like I did in this piece. So um, thank you so much. <laughs> For your attention, everybody, that was a lot of information all at once. Um, but I'm interested if anyone has any questions, I'd love to answer them for you. But that is basically uh, all of my resi residency experience um, in an hour. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you so much, Heather. That was so interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we welcome. have a ton of questions in the chat. I don't know if we're gonna have time to get to all of them. Um, I also wanna honor your time. So if you gotta head out at one, totally understand. Um, yeah, um, but there's a few. Um, some folks asked about your date, so I sent your website so they can see that, the different national parks you were at. Um, there are some general questions just about like your length of stays for different parks. Sure, um, and I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to read through the chats if we have time. I can linger okay, a little longer. Cool, so. cool, cool. 
Yeah. Um, okay. So Kelly sent out, yes, the list uh, is on my website um, with the years that I was there. Um, and they're asking, is there any application fee per park? Um, there were no application fees. However, the National Park uh, Parks Arts Foundation um, is kind of like a partner. They do um, Hawaii and the Dry Tortugas and um, I believe a couple other sites and they do have a fee for the application, but um, the ones that are straight through the National Park Service, uh, there are no fees to apply. Um, and options uh, for the lengths of stay for each park. So traditionally the residencies are about two weeks. Um, I've done one as short as one week. Um, also uh, one was a month long, um, I believe New Bedford Whaling in Massachusetts, they do three months. So they can definitely vary. Uh, mine were always over the summer because I'm a teacher. So I needed to confine it to July and August in person, but they work with you, but traditionally they're like two weeks long, um, but they like to work with you. And also I like to do as much as I can while I'm on site, but then I, I've spent up to a year working on um, artwork, like on my own time to finish a series. Cause I think it's um, more interesting to, to do an entire series than say just one piece of artwork. But then traditionally they can just want you to do one piece as well. So I kind of went overboard with all of those, but um, they do uh, vary in length. Um, are meals included? So every residency that I've done before, um, there has been, they traditionally offer you housing, um, but they don't cover travel costs or meal costs. But then other parks don't provide housing, but then they provide a stipend, which kind of covers that. So those sort of vary as well. Um, but traditionally they offer you housing and that's it, but some uh, will offer a stipend to help offset your costs. Uh, let's see, do the parks require artists doing a commission for them and leave it there? So traditionally um, they expect a piece be donated to their permanent collection, but I have been to parks where uh, they didn't have room in their collections, or I would provide them with like digital images and then keep the artwork myself. But I think traditionally they would like to at least have copies of um, what you create there. Uh, photography is one of the medium, mediums that you can apply um, for. So photography, um, some of the parks, I know the Everglades uh, National Park is very conceptual with the type of artists that they want to um, have come to their park. So performance artists. Um, uh, so there's some parks where you can absolutely do kind of different types, um, you know, some even writers, but photography is definitely one that they're interested in. And I believe some of the parks in the West um, also want like dark sky photographers. So there's, there's definitely room for that if you do photography. Uh, next question is, do you have a dream park that you'd like to do a residency at in the future? Yes, well, they're all dream parks, but um, each year I do apply to Acadia um, and also to every park possible in Alaska. Um, I think that would just be really special and also Hawaii. Um, so I would love to go travel to those areas, but basically any park that offers a residency is a dream. Um, and uh, do you have an art style or medium that you'd like to experiment with more moving forward? Good question. Um, I would love to maybe try some more like three-dimensional, um, like during the school year, I do teach um, clay to my students. And I think maybe it would be really fun to try something, um, you know, clay-based at some point, um, because it's something that I don't have too much experience with. I'm so focused on 2D. I think it would be fun to sort of branch out. Um, oh, and that's from Jacob White. Hey, Jacob. Jacob was kind enough to help me out while I was at the park too with tours and unlocking doors. Um, so how far uh, in advance does one need to apply for a summer or fall residency? Great question. Um, they actually start like now. I think uh, Acadia, their deadline is in September. Uh, Petrified Forest, I just looked. Um, their application period is from August 1st to August 31st. So a lot of them open up in the fall, if you wanna start looking at those. And then also, um, kind of throughout the year, like I would say as late as April, I've seen deadlines, um, actually maybe even May, but a bunch of them like open up in the fall. So um, soon I would say start looking now. Um, and Kelly sent a link to my website. Elizabeth Billings was the one. Okay, thank you. And then uh, 
Thank you. Um, just a note about the renditions of the mansion. And thank you, Hillary, for your kind comment. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically it. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. <laughs> well, I want to thank everyone again for the uh, attention that you gave me because that was a lot of information. So I really, I really appreciate it very much. Thank you so much, Heather. That was great. Oh, are pets allowed to come with you is our final question. Ooh, good question. <laughs> um, you know, since I don't have one, um, I have like 25 houseplants, but I don't have any pets. So it wasn't really on my radar. I want to say Hawaii does not allow pets, but some of them might, if they offer housing, might allow pets. And certainly if you kind of, if they don't offer housing and you have to get your own housing anyway, um, you know, certainly you would just find a place that accepts pets, but I'm sorry, I don't, that's not on my radar. So I'm not entirely sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Heather. Um, and for information about our artisan residency programs at the National Park um, here at Marsh Billings Rockefeller, um, just go to our website, click get involved and then the artisan residence program. And you can see all of that information right there. Heather's work will be up on our website soon. And uh, we'll put the link to this on our website as well. Um, so you can share it with anyone you'd like. Um, thanks again, Heather, uh, for thank an you, awesome Kelly. presentation. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for the kind comments and, and the questions. Thank you. <laughs>